Okay, so this is going to cover basically QTAG UID quarter to the idle timer. And well, we're going to also discuss why, well, maybe I think um, NFAC plus owner might not be sufficient for what we want to try to achieve here. Um, so it started off in 2011, first quarter. NF Act was not available. And I had to deal with um, kernel 2635 for the platform I was developing on, and it had to work on that one. So I ended up looking around, um, and I didn't see anything that could have actually helped me. I, I looked into um, containers, um, namespaces. I looked at the other um, IP tables and net filter modules, looked at the traffic controller, um, being able to hand, handle things like TC indexes. And what we needed is to replace the UID stats that are in Android. Um, those actually require hooks inside the TCP stack to call, um, call into UID stats. Um, also, we needed to have um, traffic stats on a per device basis. Um, we couldn't trust what's in PropNet dev, because it turns out that the device drivers that we're looking at either reset their counters at random times without never calling um, any of the net events. So there was no way to consistently ensure that for specific devices, we won't go in over a certain threshold. And this was required because um, data plans for mobile phones started to introduce capping. Um, in Europe, it's very common here, less. So we needed to have a way to present to the user something that you could say, hey, I, I need to limit myself. And we needed to be able to track efficiently. Um, our initial implementations were good enough that um, some of the carriers turned to us and says, holy crap, you guys are doing it better than our own app. Um, we're going to give up our app and then just use your stuff. Um, we needed to be able to also distinguish, well, actually put blame, blame on people who are using apps on services that are doing data usage. And one of the problems we stumbled upon was to be able to distinguish download managers. So UID sat is not just sufficient because it's going to say, hey, this is the system server or download manager, but actually it's some other app that's using the download manager to get something. So we needed to um, assign blame like that. And another one of the APIs that we wanted to do was to have the individual applications being able to say, well, actually I open one socket and on this socket I'm going to do a whole bunch of things, but I need to be able to subdivide data usage on those different things. Um, uh, Things like maps would do tile prefetching. It will do authentication. It will do user-facing tile fe fetching. And one of the features we were looking for was to be able to do traffic, traffic shaping in the long run. So we needed to have like the um, maps being able to say, well, right now I'm going to use this socket that's been open for the last hour and I've been doing stuff on the user. I'm going to use this socket to prefetch tiles based on your estimated destination. And that's one of the things that wasn't um, ex easily uh, obtainable by just manipulating net filters and ownership. So it's, yeah, with net filters, you can say, yeah, I've opened the communication, and right now I can tag it in a certain way or log against it. So what we wanted to be able to do is have this app quickly go in without having to go through all of the IP tables. Um, one of the worries that we had was um, all the locking mechanism that needs to go around concurrent accesses to be able to change the rules in different tables. And so we needed a different API, uh, similar to like um, Quota 2 from the Xtable add-ons, that allows you to quickly read out a quota and actually reset it without having the need to go and look into IP table itself. It's got a procfs entry for that. Um, another thing we needed to be able to add enforcement, that's why we introduced the quota stuff. And third-party applications, we needed to be able to track all data usage, including applications that weren't cooperating with the system. So it's not like somebody opens up a socket and then says, oh, by the way, somewhere, somebody in the Android framework, please add some IP tables rules for me because I'm, I'm doing something specific. Um, so QTAG UID. Initially, Q signed in for quota, but it turns out that um, I stumbled upon quota two that satisfied the needs that I wanted. And I, so I didn't end up implementing that. And the way QTAG UID works is it allows the, the sockets to be tagged. It keeps a data structure inside for each of the, the sockets that are open and tagged. Um, and an application can go in and say, well, 
this socket that I have open, now I want you to tag it with a specific tag. And at that point, accounting, all the traffics that go through the module will have counters associated with that tag for that specific socket. And that's the mechanism that the download manager uses. It opens up a socket that it's, it's got a pool of sockets. Some of them stay open for a very long time. And suddenly now it says, hey, the music player needs to get an MP3. OK, no problem. Download manager goes and tells the QTAG UID module, by the way, this socket that has this FD, um, I need you to start counting against this other UID. Um, also, the QTAG UID module tracks all of the interface statistics, and it keeps them persistent. It turns out that on mobile phones, um, the, the modem makers, they pop, pop up interfaces, and then they tear them down. Oh, you're changing from 3G to Edge. Interface goes away. New interface comes back up. You're going back to Edge to 3G. And this is why PropNet Dev didn't work for us because we needed to be able to detect when interfaces went down. And these guys, they don't use net events to say, I'm tearing my interface down. They just tear it down, reset the counters. Or worse, they say they tear it down, but don't reset the counters, bring it back up later, and it's got the counters from previously. Um, so the QTAG UID module, instead, we hook it up in IP tables at the lowest possible levels, and it tracks for all the SKBs that come in. It stores them against uh, the specific interfaces. And those are persistent, whether the interface exists or not. You can always go and query the QTAG UID module and say, hey, give me my stats. And it keeps statistics um, at the protocol level as much as possible. Um, so we talked a little bit about applications tagging their, own, tagging their own sockets. Like Gmail can say, I'm fetching attachments. How much is that costing the user? As opposed to, I'm fetching headers. And I'm fetching things in the background. Um, and that needs to happen. It happens pretty frequently. There's also um, the notion of foreground, background. And we've got different sets of counters. QTAG UID maintains them. And then um, the, the Android OS and Digode, they come in and say, oh, I'm switching you from foreground to background. Instead of having to go through IP tables and change some rules to say, oh, from now on, these counters are actually the foreground counters, um, QTAG UID has a very simple interface where it's quite easy to just poke and flip the counters. And then you can flip them back. Um, the choice of interface that, that we use for it is through ProcFS, because um, it was like one of the initial ones that we needed to have because we needed to be, to, to be able to handle debugging. Um, but we left ourselves the opportunity to switch over to either SysFS or IOCTLs or some other mechanism. Um, and also QTAG UID, as I said, it's replacing the UID stats of Android, which requires the hooks for TCP. Um, Oh, yeah, some things that didn't work, like quota. The original quota didn't support um, IPv6. Uh, so we ended up having to do some tweaks there. Uh, um, so that's basically covered. So these are some of the differences between the original NetFilter modules and how we use them and how we've changed them. So these are now going over the changes that we need to deal with. Quota 2, it's, like I said, it's the Xtables add-on initially checked in as is. And then the only thing that we added um, was sending up U events when we hit uh, quotas. Why U events? Because most of what Android does in terms of networks, it's already got listeners in place for the, the U events. And so now when a U event triggers, it just sends out the quota, giving it the actual name and how it's hit. Quota 2 was interesting because it actually supports SMP. The quota that's currently in the kernel, well, OK, that was in the kernel back then, didn't support SMP because it kept its counters in um, per CPU stats. So you end up having these quotas that increment randomly. If you're lucky that all the SKBs come in on the same, PU, you're, same CPU, you're good to go. If not, it's a big mess. Quota 2 is SMP safe. Named quotas was interesting because we can name some of them like, hey, this is a warning for 3G, or this is a warning for LTE. And the framework um, that handles connect, the connectivity manager can now know that it's reached a given warning quota. So U event, that's the only change. Um, the XT idle timer. Um, we use that to be able to handle um, cell interfaces that go down over a certain amount of time. The problem is the modem manufacturers, they do not advertise when their cell, the, the modem, goes into low power mode. Um, and it's the cell towers that tells the phone, oh, you, you can turn off your cell now. 
but the phone keeps an, a connection and the device is still up. So it's completely invisible to the user. The only thing that happens is if you send a packet like after five seconds, you're going to put your modem back into high power. So we need to have something that would help user space say, well, okay, I'm going to kind of delay sending packets maybe for a few more seconds just in case I've got more. Instead of doing sending one packet, waiting 10 seconds, sending another packet, now we wait 20 seconds and then we send two packets and we save on power like that. So we took the original um, idle timer, uh, we switched again to uEvent because that's the interface that we use mostly for networking stuff. And we needed another change on top of that is the one to track when the interface goes active again. Because soon as somebody turns on the interface or if the cell tower tells our phone, hey, you, you need to go to full power mode, we can start piggybacking on that event and bursting out small packets, saving power there. Um, so now, last thing is QTAG UID versus what I know about um, XT owner and the NF Act. So um, the NF Act module came 11 months after um, I had designed and done the QTAG UID stuff. What QTAG UID avoids is having to manipulate the IP tables during no normal operation. Um, XT QTAG UID ends up hooked up in the in IP tables rules at the start when the device comes up. And those rules never need to change. All the SKPs go through them, and all the tracking happens inside XTQ.UID. Using the PROC, uh, PROC, uh, PROCFS interface in uh, PROCNEC XTQ.UID control, um, applications, like native applications, they just need to write to it and say, hey, oh, here's an FD that belongs to me. I would like you to tag it for me, and from now on, you're going to start tracking my custom tag. Um, things like reading back out statistics, same thing over PROCFS. No need to go through IP tables and looking at counters. It's all stored internally. Um, and also being able to switch an application from foreground to background repeatedly, it's just a matter of saying, hey, this PID, you need to use your other counter set for it. Um, and then switch back without, again, having to go and manipulate IP tables, rules at runtime. Um, and also from NF Act and XT owner, it would seem like to be able to track every single app individually, it would require to have one rule per installed app inside the system. And if you've got a large number of apps, it ends up getting pretty big. And now if apps wanted to track, like Gmail saying, hey, I need to check quotas, um, not quotas, I need to start tracking downloads of attachments, please add a new rule for me specifically. Now you end up having Gmail adding five different rules just so it can track its own little features, um, its, its own little downloads for the services that it, it's doing. Um, so instead of that, we have, again, Single rules in IP tables and static. System starts up, it keeps them in there. No need to tweak with it. Um, Escape. Uh, are you going to put the uh, um, application specific rules into the? Um, no, actually, no, you don't. The app, so the application rules, you don't. It's, it's not really rules. It's the application just says, my socket, I want you to start tagging it. And so the accounting rules that are set up, uh, let's switch back to present. Maybe if I do. Well, same with the same with the idle. You know, it's different apps you might want different idle behavior. So these are the rules that are, are that are set up. Um, one of the things we don't do is shaping per app, but we allow an individual app to tag different sockets or one socket, retag it multiple times, and then read out its stats. Without that, doesn't need to change any of the rules. So it just uses the existing rules for tracking. Um, internally, XTQ tag UID, as soon as it sees an SKB, says, hey, SKB, what socket are you tied to? Hey, socket, what's your fill P? Who's the owner? 
and it stores it against that. If there's no fill P associated with it or there's no SK associated with the SKB, it says, okay, unsolicited packet. Oh, it also uses the connection tracker. So if it's an ongoing communication, it can find actually the owner to its destination. If it's unsolicited and it can't find it, it'll just say, hey, this is packet that belongs to the system and it needs to count it, even if there's no listener because the carrier is still going to bill you for unsolicited IP traffic. Um, And so that covers kind of the changes that we have so far. What, any other questions? Why do you use So, so. True. So, 2635, I look around what's available in Net -Net Filter, and I look at how people talk to the other Net Filter modules that are there, and it's like, okay, seems like a way to go. If we needed to, we could switch to something else. It was like the minimal interface for a human to be able to debug, and it was sufficient, and we could handle it from the framework, the Android framework. But I'm willing to switch to anything else, IOCTLs um, with custom, custom commands, uh, SysFS if needed. Okay. So the, 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 lib, the libnet link um, that's in the Android stack came after this. So we did look at the amount of work. Okay, how much effort does it take to get netlink up and running? Started looking into how IP tables does it itself and said, holy crap, I need to pull all this in. And then when I started talking to the AOSP guys, and it's like, ah, GPL, wrong version. Uh. <laughs> but yes, um, now that we have a LibNL2, um, I can go back and revisit it and pos possibly pick Netlink. I'm, I'm open to that. Oh. It, seemed, it seemed decent. I'm against LibNL, but that's a different story. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we would do this by ourselves. I just, strictly speaking, from the kernel interface, uh, Netlink is an easier way to get this out, especially okay. asynchronous, so we don't actually have to start pulling this one. If you really don't have, what we'd like to see is something you can just update, so in X amount of uh, time, please, X amount of packets, just tell us, let's give us an update that you have uh, uh, consumed whatever packets you just consumed, because we're actually tracking some of this stuff directly from RTNL. Before the device goes away, we actually write them to disk, so we actually have the basic stats from the uh, device and then know the maximum they're gonna yeah. get from this one, and feeding this one in on a similar level would be nicely matched together if mm -hmm. we can get this over netlink and don't have to then start pulling a, oh, hold on, what do you actually consume there? The, the, don't forget, the, the devices lie about their stats. Some of the devices that we have, they actually count in their stats um, traffic that they send up to user space, but are, it's control sign band traffic. So you end up being off by like five to 10%. Oh, I would love to use this uh, completely okay. and just don't rely on the wise, but, but there's some of the stuff we have to do. Um, my other question that actually uh, is a little more important. So you say you're going to do this basically on UIDs and UIDs only. Um, UIDs and tags. The, um, the socket contains two sets of information. One is the UID, and it defaults to the owner of the, the socket. But um, the download manager can say a specific socket now belongs to a different UID. And it can associate a tag with it that says, oh, by the way, this traffic for this UID came from the download manager. So when you look at the statistics, you can say, oh, I see this application's been using this much data. But you look at a tag and you say, oh, this is the tag that the download manager set. Fair enough. What I was hinting in is like, can we get this also with C groups? So um, we can do this per C group? So I looked a little bit about, uh, looked, looked, looked a little bit um, in C groups and it didn't seem convenient enough to be able to allow any kind of app to be able to use it lightly. Um, from my understanding, it was that to be able to start manipulating the C groups and getting those type of counters specifically for an app, it would require the app to either talk to some C group controller and say, oh, I need you to do this on my behalf, go and mess around with my C groups, I need specific stats, I need a specific network device, set it all up for me. With this solution, 
the app directly itself. If it's native, it doesn't even need to talk to some manager that's in Android. It's, hey, tag my socket. And QTag UID will say, wait, do you actually own this FD? Do you own this socket? OK, fine, go ahead. Fair enough for Android, but on the desktop, where systemd okay. stuffs you in a C group anyway, so yes. you would be confined just from the start. That's where we are coming from, where actually, OK, the application is in the C group. Mm -hmm. Systemd has enforced it in it, so it is right there. That would make we don't have to deal with any UIDs to whatever's in that C group. That's what the app has done and what process it's born and whatever. Yeah. So we don't have a C group per app. How, how much effort would it be in theory? So assume the app gets put in a C group just from the kernel side. How much would it take to actually change something like that? Um, if an app is already in its own C group, that means it gets its own network interface with its own stats. Um, you can't trust the devices. Even bridge is broken. The Rx and Tx don't count the headers in the right way. Sometimes it adds them and sometimes it doesn't. Um, no, we want to do this based on sockets. So assume okay. the system B had post, uh, put the app in a C group that's all there and what socket it opened and what it consumed over that socket. Um, does it do the socket um, cons consumption over protocols? We need to detect UDP, TCP and IP. I'm just, no, I'm going through a different way. The, okay. app, the app just opens X amount of sockets mm -hmm. uh, on whatever interface they're going to have access to. Yeah. Um, and the kernel knows that this app is in a C group, so can we just automatically uh, tag these and track them and then get the stats on the app in that C group? Um, potentially. Right now, there's no need to tag a socket. The default is it's automatically assigned to the owner of it. But yeah, we could p potentially go down the C group part, but it would require putting an app in each individual C group. And then how would delegation work in this case? You're the download manager, you're in your C group, and now you've got a socket that actually doesn't really belong to you. It needs to belong to somebody else. That's definitely something that needs to be figured out. Therefore, that you could, as okay. you guys would understand, you guys using extra tags for this one. Yes, we use extra tags the app for then, this one. Where the download manager then puts an extra tag on there, yeah. which on the desktop side, we could potentially do as well, since most of things goes over Diva, so you know the owner and you can, the download manager or whatever app you want to do, or if you do something on behalf of something else, you can just tag it, but the original C group would be still in place at that mm -hmm. point. So what we are seeing from some other sides, the C group part is way more flexible, and we don't have the strict UID separation like you have with an Android. Every app is there on UID, we just don't have this, and in some worse sites, we are never getting there. And I, since I know we need these things, uh, I would actually like to get into a solution that is upstream that we can use. We get the stats out properly, and we can just share this. That's where I want to really go, because we're doing exactly, well, not exactly, but we're doing really similar things, and Daniel probably can give some comments on this one as well, okay. to actually get per application statistics out of the system, and it's really painful. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we do it for Coleman, and we're using NF Act and IP table rules, and yeah, we feel the pain already. Um, so it seems like it's not the right thing to do, right? Uh, to go in that direction. And I looked also on your work, and uh, well, it looks good, but we have an additional requirement. We want also to do the routing, so we have more than one interface up. So we want to also enforce which route it has to take. So yeah. <laughs> Any other? It's um, Android AOSP. Yeah, um, one of the reasons it's kept so compact is in case it never got upstreamed, it made my life easier to maintain. Unlike UID stats that's got hooks in the TCP stack, this guy has got hooks nowhere. It's completely independent. No. <laughs> Linaro, Linaro guys sent it to. So we are the NetApp guys right here. So we can tell you that for a low amount of traffic, uh, NFQ is the way to go because you can intercept all packets in Network Manager and decide whatever you want to do. It's a user policy, all this stuff. And all the infrastructure is there already. So, um, And you don't have to worry to upstream anything. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? It's a, I mean, 
how many packets you receive on your on this device. Um, actually, quite qu quite a lot. And if you like, on. So what? No, no. This That's is this is expensive. Um, and no, absolutely not. You receive the packets. The cost is waking up the, your device. Spending one hundred seconds to process the packet is not. Uh, Face it. I mean. And if Q is the way to go for this low amount of traffic, up to 10,000 packets per second, it's fine. It's because it's, it seems to me that you have a lot of stuff. For example, the XT idle time thing, it's a packet scheduler issue. It's not a net filter issue. You need some kind of packet scheduler to solve this issue. It's um, not a high beatable sorry, stuff. The, uh, the, X, the XT idle, it's only used to be able to see when the last packet went out and if we've reached a certain Delay. Sorry, I don't, don't really hear you. The, the XT idle timer, yeah. it's, it's not used as really as a scheduler. It's just to be able to see when an interface has slept long enough. And we can then infer that it's went into so its low power state. So what are you doing state. with the packet? You drop it? No, no, no. We just look at it fly by and we say, oh, we saw a packet on, this, on the cell interface. Yeah. And we reset the counter. And if eight seconds elapse, then we get a notification in user space that says, hey, this interface has been idle for eight seconds. There's a high likelihood it went into low power mode. Try not to talk to it. And if a packet comes in, and if, if a packet comes in from the cell tower, it's going to wake up the interface, and then we'll get another notification, and it mm -hmm. then tells the framework, okay, if you need to send messages, you need to do tickles or pushes or whatever, go ahead, do it now. You've got eight seconds before the interface goes back to idle. That's the only reason we, we use it. We don't, use, um, we don't have traffic shaping built so on top of it. So you intercept incoming traffic or outgoing traffic? Both. Incoming and outgoing. And all it does, it just resets the timer. We don't, we don't look at the packet itself. We just know that the interface has been given or has received the packet. That's what the XT idle timer is there for. Okay. Sorry? Oh, uh, yeah. So my point is, using NFQ, you solve all this problem because all packets are in user land, so you do whatever you want. No, Every but we, we, we don't need some. them to be in user land. For something like the, the XI idle timer, there's no need to copy a packet. Up you don't you copy the packet. NFQ don't copy. It's a zero copy path. OK. You for only copy the headers. For That's it. How you do you, how do you deal with IP, um, um, IPv6? The options are at the end. So if you look at what the connection tracker does, you need to walk your IPv6 headers. So you're going to need a lot of data to be able to handle IPv6 it's packets. It's done automatically. It's the flow detector thing. It's generic. You don't have to care about it. So in some cases, like some of the protocols, we just don't care about introspection. But now, because of the way, if, if we want to have the generic method that you're saying send all the packets to user land, you'd always have to send all the data up. And then, then in user land, determine that, oh, by the way, we didn't need to look at the data because the protocol that's used inside the packet, I don't care. For what's later yeah, on. So, so what? So you are adding in a kernel all this stuff? On it's, it's, it, so what? Um, copying stuff up to user space just to be able to realize, oh, we actually didn't need it. We could have figured it out by looking at five bytes at the kernel level. It's waking up all of user space and waking up everybody just to be able to realize that only. NFQ gives all the metadata you want. Just ask to fill the metadata you want. Ten thousand packets. I can. I, 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 okay. I think it's millions of packets per second. Yeah, it's uh, it's really millions of packets, and you don't really need to copy or even zero copy any of the okay. packet data to user space. If you're only interested in headers, you could just set a cap, and it will only um, provide the first two hundred bytes of the packet to user space. So it's not necessary to copy. Well, it's not really copying, but to, to even provide the full packet data to user space. So it offers the equivalent of connection tracker that will be able to say this is actually the owner of this packet from the SK. 
Yeah, so I mean, the connection tracking data is all exported to, to user space. You can just look it up. Right? There's a network interface to, to get okay. all the connection tracking data you want. So user space, each time it would get a packet, it would have to go back and ask the connection tracker, oh, yeah, I just got this from NFQ. Now tell me. Only on, on your flow miss, if you keep the uh, cache on, on your network manager, you only need to ask for the connection tracking info if it's a, a new flow. So okay. for the first packet, the SYN packet or... Plus, you actually, you actually get um, a Netlink notification when a new connection tracking entry is added. So you don't even need to poll. You can actually keep your cache in user space current without even polling once. What, what, what we are saying that this is a very customized and specific hack for Android and maybe for other mobile devices. And it's probably not generic enough to put, okay. be put into the kernel. And as long as there are other ways to solve it, like NFQ. Um, then probably need to, I don't know enough about NFQ and the oh, solution you're su suggesting. I work for Google, just okay. come to my so Absolutely. <laughs> stuff. Pa perfect, perfect. Sure. I'm, I'm open to um, other ways to implement and this that would work. need to push some um, NetFilter extension, we will do that together. But I don't think so, really. Um, yeah, from my perspective, pushing up is okay, whatever. <laughs> It's performance and maintenance. I had one more follow-up question. Why do you even need to use idle timer? Can't you just look at the interface statistics? No. It would also tell you if the interface is active or not. Actually, no. Why not? Um, this, 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 you should see how these guys handle their interfaces. Um, sometimes it's some USB-derived device. Um, we need to see the packets that go out and what goes underneath. They don't maintain their statistics properly inside their interfaces. The dev. Okay, so it's a, it's a hardware problem that you could fix as well, actually. Oh, that we, we could fix? Yeah, no. Those are black boxes. We've tried talking. We've, we, want, we want to get rid of this idle timer. We've been talking to the vendor saying, okay, you need to tell us. You know exactly how long the cell tower is told, is told you to stay alive. We've actually got a bug open against a couple of the vendors telling them, provide this interface for us so we, can, we don't have to do this hack. That's guessing at best. Because the cell tower is going to say, hey, depending on your carrier, stay up eight seconds. No, stay up five seconds, 10 seconds. We don't know. But one of, our, one of the companies that we worked with a couple of years back had the brilliant idea to, uh, that user space should trigger the idle procedure where the modem knows way better when you're idle. That also, OK, so we have to wake up all the way to turn the modem then into an idle mode. And they never understood this. This was actually a real problem. So this is on the level, I feel your pain on this one, by the way. This is on the level we're talking with the modem manufacturers. They have all the information inside the modem, but you can't, can't control any of this one. OK. Yeah, so idle timer, we really want to get rid of it. We're, as much as possible, we're pushing vendors as hard as we can. <laughs> um, what about quota two? Maybe we can get rid of that one or deal with it. <laughs> so, I had another question. Um, so, for quota two is one of the op open things that we haven't quite discussed yet. The current, what, my, from my perspective, what's currently in the kernel quota is utterly useless. Um, and quota two from the X tables add-on should probably maybe go in the kernel and replace the quota that's inside the kernel. Quota two is SMP safe. The current quota is not SMP safe. And We fix, we fix bug, net filter bugs every week, so it's another, another bug, if there um, is a bug. So from my perspective, it's, I, I can see it as being fixed. Somebody will say, hey, why don't you use Xtables add-ons? IP tables already supports it, and um, we're good to go. And I'm just saying, hey, maybe get rid of the one that's in the kernel and move that one down. That's all. I'm, I'm, the way it's done doesn't, doesn't matter. Yeah, file a bug. I, I can file a if bug. If you believe there is a bug, just fill a bug report. Fix the bug. I know that. Well, my fix for the bug is we, put, we can fix put quota two inside the, the Linux kernel. That's Sorry? my fix. My, my fix is to put quota two from Xtables add-on into the kernel. Perfect. Okay. Why not? That's 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 the feedback that I wanted to hear. That some people might say no, leave it outside, and some people might say yes, put it in. So, um, who who is the uh, uh, young, I can't remember the guy's name who uh, did the quota two. It was uh, 
The angle iron hurts or um, it's in the source. But uh, at one point, I kind of reached out to say, like, hey, uh, uh, you know, is this something that you're already pushing upstream? And he said that you know it had been through discussions and gotten shut down. So for whatever reasons, Quota Two was you know unlikely to move upstream. And I guess the question is, what is going to be the upstream? So in Google, we tried using contracting model, and we realized it was a bit difficult because there is a single spin lock protecting the whole contracting structure. So I spent three, four, five days breaking the rock into many locks so that we can scale the thing. I sent a patch for that filter, and I got an answer from that filter guys three months later. So don't worry. Yeah, these guys are some sometimes very busy and take time to reply. But I got a reply three months later, so you know, just send it again. And if you have a valid use case, I think it can. Okay. It can be done. Yeah. But yeah, I guess Jan was not very optimistic that Quota Two would get upstream. So if if, if at least we can. Um, uh, 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 crisply describe the issues that you need out of Quota 2, that might help get, you know, some solution okay. that works. I mean, that's, that's, that's the hard part is that, you know, uh, if the requirements, I guess, aren't uh, clear to folks upstream, then sometimes they seem it's easier just not to have. Okay. Um, getting the rules up front, we're kind of for happy, yeah, for now. <laughs> Maybe we can talk about the advantages of not pushing the rules up front. Okay. Look really quickly at the list of questions that I had. Um, Libanel 2, we've got this like minimalistic version of Libanel, Libanel in um, uh, Where did it go? Come on, search. Let's see if I can put it up. So yeah, we've got a minimalistic version here under LibNL2. Oh, yeah, I'll have to look and see what's in there that will go, that can be modified so I can actually talk to the QTAG UID module or get information out that I care about faster. So for the idle timer one, um, I know Matthew Barrier was uh, worried about uh, the renaming of the interface to oh, label part. Um, is that not an issue? That, that, that's completely a non-issue. It's that when we looked at it, everywhere in X, uh, the idle timer, it's, it's, it's got iFace interface, but actually it's referring to it as label in all the documentation and text. Uh, but we don't care about okay. the name. We it, absolutely it, don't care. He was just worried about you know, it being an like API break, basically. So. Yeah, we didn't realize that, holy crap, we're changing uh, an API that's user facing. Our mistake. So I, I don't know if there's any more questions or discussion that you had planned for this. So as, as far as kind of the takeaways, um, it seems like uh, for idle time, right, I don't think, with, with, were the objections too strong there or is the remaining, because I think there's only three patches or something like that for that? It's minimalistic. It just yeah, adds, you event, changes. it adds activity detection, and the last one we can completely get rid of because it's not a feature. It was just yeah. what seemed to be a clean, so a clean up. If those two, if, if there's not an objection to the usage of it in that way, I, you know, I feel like those two should be fairly easy to push and try to get upstream. Um, the QTA QED uh, part, you know, we can see if the um, other suggestions would work. And then quota two, we're going to try to establish the requirements, I guess, <laughs> clearly, so that we can see what to fix. 
No, this. I think this is going to be the main one. I'll compare. So all this adds is the notify net link you event. That is the only one we care about. Sorry? <laughs> ah. okay. All right, well, if there's nothing else, uh, thanks so much. Okay, thank you.